Okay, good morning everyone, uh, or good afternoon depending on your location, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. What about the content, improving your message and asset quality through smarter automation? My name is Steve Jones, Vice President of Marketing here at Corporate Visions, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, before we get started though, I do want to go over some housekeeping items so we can make today's event uh, as interactive as possible for everybody. Uh, you should have joined the presentation using your computer speakers by default, but if you prefer to join over the telephone, just go ahead and select telephone in the audio pane, and that dial-in information will be displayed for you. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane on the control panel. Uh, feel free to send in your questions at any time during today's event, and we'll go ahead and collect those and answer as many as we can during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Uh, also, as a reminder following the event, we'll be sending all attendees a recording of today's webcast along with the slides within the next 24 hours or so. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. First, I'd like to introduce our very special guest today, Jason Kiever, Vice President of Europe at Seismic, uh, a leader in the B2B marketing enablement and sales enablement software space, and Leslie Talbot, Vice President of Customer and Commercial Excellence here at Corporate Visions. Leslie, I, I uh, believe you are kicking it off for us today, so let me turn it over to you. The floor is yours. I am. Thank you, Steve. Uh, welcome, everybody. And Jason, thank you so much for partnering with us on this webinar. I'm yeah, really happy to have your perspective because we're in such an interesting time right now in the world of enablement technology. And there have been so many advances just in the last few years that it feels like there's a new breakthrough coming every day. But at the same time, co companies are still wrestling with some of the same challenges that they've always had, regardless of the technology. So for folks who are on the webinar, um, I'm going to speak to some of those challenges and what our perspective is on those. And Jason, I know you're going to address the technology side. So we'd love to get your thoughts and insights as we go through. Yeah, really happy to excited to join with you guys and, and obviously really interested in the, uh, the discussion topic. So, so thanks again, Leslie. Okay, so let's let's start with what some of those challenges are. And one of the big challenges that organizations are still facing is that age-old divide between sales and marketing. Aligning sales and marketing is something that I have heard clients talk about for as long as I've been in this business, which is a really long time. So the idea that you need to align sales and marketing is nothing new. And you would think that because everybody knows that we need to do it, with everybody talking about it, with everybody studying it, with everybody organizing around it, we would all be pretty far down the path to making it actually happen. And the question is, are we? Um, one of the ways to measure how well sales and marketing are working together is to look at conversions. So how are companies doing at converting their content-driven leads into sales pipeline? You'd think, you'd assume that if companies are doing a good job at alignment, that's going to be reflected in conversions. So Corporate Visions did some research on this, and these are some of the numbers that represent our findings. What we found in our research is only 11% of the companies we surveyed said that they are excellent at converting content-driven leads to pipeline. And what's more, almost half of the companies we surveyed said that their efforts are either sketchy or failing to drive trackable impact. So what this is saying is that even though everybody knows they need to do a better job aligning sales and marketing, there is still a disconnect. So it's worth kind of taking a step back and thinking about the traditional approach to content creation. Because um, not a lot has really changed. So content is still being created in silos, typically along two tracks. So you have your self-service content that gets produced by your demand gen engine. So that's campaigns, social, the assets customers can find on their own and download from the web. And marketing owns 78% of that content. They create it, they track it, they're responsible for it, and they're, they're really good at it. And then there's the sales-directed content, that is the playbooks, the call guides, presentations, any assets salespeople use when they engage in custom, with customers. And approximately 48% or nearly half of all of that content gets created outside of marketing. So it's being created by enablement, it's being created by product management, 
or heaven forbid, it's getting created by sales reps by themselves in their basements, cranking out their own PowerPoints. So this leads to a condition that we call the conversion gap, where marketing is generating leads, sales can't close, and sales have conversations with customers that are misaligned with the messaging marketing has created. So this creates confusion among customers, it stalls your deals, and it makes it more likely that a buyer is just going to get frustrated and give up. So the good news is that marketing is involved in creating about half of all that sales-directed content. And that's a shift. It's a big shift. And it's shifted not only the way content gets created, but it actually has also affected the way that content gets served up to sellers. And here's what I mean by that. So there's a couple of different ways that companies organize their content to put it into the hands of their sellers. The first is based on what the seller is doing at any given point in the sales process. So you figure out the tasks a seller has to execute, and then you figure out what the content is that a seller is going to need at each step in their process and then you deliver it to them through their CRM or enablement system. So that's a sales-driven approach, and it's very much based on the steps that a salesperson takes to bring a deal to close, from setting an appointment to qualifying, qualifying, analyzing needs, developing the solution, and proposing and closing. The second approach isn't based on what the seller does, but it's more based around what the customer does. So this approach organizes around what marketers call the customer buying journey, and it's designed to deliver information to meet the needs of the customer at each stage in their journey. So it's great that this is a process that's more buyer-centric because you do have to take the buyer's needs into consideration when you're delivering content, but there are a few challenges with this buyer's journey approach. The first challenge is that it's based on what the customer is doing, not why the customer is doing it. So essentially, you're trying to anticipate action without a whole lot of insight into the customer's motivation for taking that action. And then the second challenge is that it assumes a purchase is inevitable, meaning the customer is going to choose you or the competition. But the research actually shows that the majority of qualified sales opportunities end up in no decision. 60% of the time, the customer ends up sticking with what they've already been doing. And Jason, you must feel this pain as a seller. Oh, Leslie, <laughs> do have have I ever? So I was I was that little guy on your previous slide uh, who uh, is in his basement sometimes creating his own content, um, trying to align with my customers. Uh, I've either you know led sales teams or or been an independent contributor myself, and and definitely felt the sixty percent of status quo, and uh, and really interested to see kind of on these next topics here as to as to as to how to break that status quo. Yeah. And then um, the, the final the, kind of the final assumption in all this is that it assumes that content creation ends with a purchase and that you don't need to adjust your messages or your content or your approach for existing customers. And that that disruptive, provocative demand gen message that was so great at helping you win the business is also going to help you keep the business. But how true is that? So let's go back to our little conversion gap diagram here for just a second. So here you see the customer buying journey overlaying the traditional path to purchase. But your business with a customer doesn't end once they become a customer. In fact, companies have a huge incentive to boost customer retention because studies actually show that even a 5% increase in retention can increase your profits by as much as 25%. So everybody's got a vested interest in holding on to those customers. But the wrong message can have the exact opposite impact on retention. Um, our own research at Corporate Visions shows that using a provocative, disruptive message on an existing customer can increase their likelihood of switching providers by 10%. So now, instead of simply having misaligned messages sales can't close, you've got mistargeted messages for customers that sales can't renew. And that creates not a, not a conversion gap, but a retention gap. And Jason, again, you and I have talked a lot about the role of marketing in this scenario. So what are the things that you're seeing out in the field? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, obviously, we partner quite a bit with our marketing teams and our customers um, to do just what you mentioned before is, is kind of aligning some of the content enablement across the sales process or the buyer's buying process and that journey. 
Um, and we also, on kind of on behalf of Seismic, have a chance to partner with a lot of the chief revenue officers, chief sales officers, and every single one of them have a revenue growth initiative to to grow current customer wallet share. Um, and I think it's I think I think it's it's a bit frightening that 10% because I I don't think I've had too many conversations with market leaders or marketing leaders, excuse me, around um, around this retention gap. So that's a really interesting point. Yeah, one of the one of the interesting things that came out of our survey actually was uh, 58% of the companies we surveyed actually don't see the need to vary their message or content based on um, a new customer or an existing customer. So I think that that number comes as a surprise to a lot of people, and it's it's informed a lot of the approach that Corporate Visions is taking to to our messaging process. Um, so. Getting back to the whole idea of um, buying process versus sales process and aligning your content, regardless of the way that you're organizing your content, whether it's around a sales process, whether it's around a customer buying journey, it's clear from the information I just shared that there's still something missing. And what's missing is the why. So in other words, the buyer psychology that motivates a customer's actions. If you can understand why they make the decisions they make, you can figure out what they need to do, what you need to do to support those decisions. So the beauty of this approach is that it's universal. When you focus on psychology, you can apply it across all buyers, all roles, all geography, because it's all about the way the brain works when it comes to framing value and making choices. So when you look at decision-making from that context, one of the things that you see is that this buying journey is really more of a deciding journey. It rests on the individual decisions and choices a buyer makes at each step of the process. So this is what a buying journey looks like. This is what a deciding journey looks like. The first question that a customer is going to ask themselves is, why should they change? So why do they need to do something different in the first place? And then once they decide that they might need to do something different, the next question they're going to ask is, why you? With all the other solutions and all the other offers that are out there, why should they choose yours? And then why should they invest their time, their budget, their credibility in pursuing your initiative? And then given all the other opportunities and priorities on their plate, why now? Particularly if they're a senior executive, why should they act now versus defer their decision until later? And then assuming that they do decide that you're worth their attention, you then need to decide, um, you, they need to decide whether or not you're worth their money. So why should they pay the price that you're asking? And then as everyone knows, in every major B2B buying decision, there are always going to be multiple stakeholders. So why should they pull everyone together and go through the due diligence necessary to finalize the purchase. So why should they sign on the line that is dotted? And that gets you to the sale, and that's great. But if you stop there, you're gonna leave your relationships and you're gonna leave opportunities on the table. That's because even if they become a customer, they're still being pursued by your competitors. They're still questioning themselves. And the question they're asking themselves now is why stay? Why should they renew or continue their relationship with you? And then finally, if you're like most organizations, you don't simply want to keep selling them the same stuff over and over and over again. You want to expand your relationship. You want to offer new capabilities. You want to move them to bigger and better solutions. So during these conversations, the question that they're asking themselves is, why evolve? So that is the customer deciding journey. And it's two different sets of conversations based on whether you're trying to acquire new customers or whether you're trying to renew or expand business with existing customers. So the way to think about this is as a filter to place over your organizing principle. So whether you're organizing your content around a buyer's journey or around a sales process, your buyer is still going to be going through the same mental decision process. So understanding where they are psychologically in relation to where you are with your process is going to help your sellers navigate their conversations more successfully, and it's going to help your marketers create content that bridges both sides of that conversion or retention gap. And again, Jason, you've led sales teams. You've been up to your elbows in this for as, as long as you've been working. So what are, your, what are some of your thoughts here? Yeah, two things come top of mind, Leslie. Uh, so first of all, I, I love 
the the idea of the the why change why you or why us if you're looking at a salesperson and then why now right those are the fundamental sales etiquettes of, of really kind of that's pretty much every sales team uses to uh to qualify a pipeline and and make sure that we're on track with uh with the right opportunity um and i think the second thing is something that comes to mind is that th these are all challenging conversations right they're not uh, they're not possibly just one conversation, but it takes some preparedness on the sales team. It takes some enablement and and really some kind of coaching that enables them to be able to go and have these difficult conversations and ultimately, uh, you know, be better aligned to that that buyer's deciding journey, as you mentioned here. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, honestly, getting your content aligned and organized within an enablement system is a giant step forward. But even though making your content accessible is one major goal, and it's an important one, ultimately you want your content to work. You want it to do its job. And that means you've got to go to the next level. So it's not just about making your content accessible, but how are you going to make sure that the content that you're creating, that you're putting into your system, is speaking to the buyer's psychology and helping them through their deciding journey? So when we look at our customers' content, we think about it as a three-level assessment or interrogation process. So what do I mean by that? So the first step of the process is understanding what is the intent of the asset? So what decision are you trying to inform? What decision are you trying to support? And then once you know this, you need to understand how closely that asset aligns to the criteria for that decision. What I mean by this is every decision, every message has its own framework and its own requirements. So that corresponding message is going to have specific unique characteristics. So just as a quick example, if you're trying to support a why change decision, you're going to follow a different message framework or choreography than you would for a why stay decision. And then finally, there's the question of how good the content itself actually is qualitatively. So I come from a content creation background. I'm a writer. And one of the most important things for me is making sure that my words and my visuals work together to effectively support the message that I'm trying to deliver. So let's take a look at each one of these levels, and then I'll show you a couple of examples of how this plays out in actual content assets. So let's take a look first at the intent diagnostic. So this is aligning the asset to the corresponding decision. Um, the first question that you're going to ask yourself as you analyze an asset is whether or not this is an acquisition message or an expansion or retention message. Where does it fall in that portion of the customer's deciding journey? And then you're going to ask yourself, what ultimately is it that you want that asset to do? So for example, if you're trying to support a wide change decision, ask yourself what you're trying to do is to disrupt the prospect status quo. And how do you do this? You do this by helping your prospects see that their current status quo is unsafe and that they need to do something different. If you're trying to support a why you message, you're looking to differentiate. You want to make sure that the prospect can see a clear distinction between your solution and the competition. And then down on the expansion side, if you're looking to support a why stay message, uh, you know, as I said, what you want to do in a why stay conversation is make sure that your asset, your message is communicating a message to the customers that the status quo is safe and that they don't want to do anything different. And then final example, if you're trying to upsell them to a new solution, you're going to try to expand your business with that customer. And that means getting the customer to upgrade their existing solution or buy additional solutions for you. So again, there's specific criteria that you can apply to each one of these messages to make sure that they follow the appropriate choreography. But if you build it all out according to the deciding journey, then all of a sudden you're able to create messages and assets that answer the buyer's deciding questions at the exact moment in time that they're asking them. And then by aligning your assets and content around those decisions, you're making sure that the messages are consistent on both sides of the sales and, and marketing gap. So, for example, to answer the why change question, you might want to create infographics and ebooks for your campaigns and then feed those same messages in those campaigns to sales reps by giving them whiteboards and coaching guys that help them have those same provocative conversations in the field. When you're talking about capabilities during your why you conversations, your marketers can create things like downloadable buyer's guides for customers and then 
feed that information into call prompters for reps to put your capabilities into the context of the customer's challenges. To get a customer to decide to invest time and capital in exploring your solution, you can educate them through executive briefs that you run through campaigns, and then give your sellers capabilities decks that align specifically your solutions to strategic initiatives that are taking place on the customer side. To create a sense of urgency and get senior decision makers to act now, you can develop things like justification briefs and business cases that lay out the business and financial argument for immediate change. To get them to pay your asking price, show them case studies, show them case studies of customers who purchased your solution and are reaching their goals, and then crunch the numbers for them by giving your reps interactive ROI analyses so that the customers can see the value for themselves. And then finally, to get them over the finish line and get them to close that deal, you can have marketing participate in creating executive summaries for proposals that tie your, your, your world-facing messages to the specific sales opportunity. And then for your sellers, you want to arm them with things like champion kits that are going to help them help their customers sell your solutions internally. Now, once they cross the Rubicon and they become a customer, you're going to change the focus of your message. So that means that you want to offer up proprietary experiences, things like newsletters, customer-only content that lets them know that you know that they're a customer, that you understand that they're a customer, and reassure them of the wisdom of working with you. And then you can give your reps messaging in quarterly business review decks that start to reiterate and reinforce the safety of their status quo. Again, since they've made a decision to work with you, you want them to be satisfied. You want them to feel like they're making progress toward their goals. So I always say that if you're waiting until renewal time to have a renewal conversation, you've waited too long. But if you start feeding some of this reinforcement information into the quarterly reviews your reps do with customers, then it's not going to be a big jolt to them when the renewal comes along. And then finally, when it's time for the upsell, you need to leverage your relationship with them to educate them about new industry trends, which in turn create new opportunities for you, and then help connect those trends to their evolving needs and new capabilities that you've developed to support those needs. And those are all materials that sales reps can use to add value to all of their customer interactions. So as I sit back and look at this, there's a ton of content on this slide. And one of the big challenges for sellers is how do you make sure that you're using the right asset with the right buyer at the right time? And that's an important question that, Jason, I'm going to make you answer because I know that you've got some great thoughts on this. Absolutely. I'm that little guy in the bottom left part of the screen, <laughs> your screen right there, right? The sales-directed content. I, I'm, I'm managing, you know, 25 plus different opportunities and, and both doing customer expansion and, and net new logos. And to be honest with you, you know, Leslie, this is kind of where the traditional content management strategies for sales and marketing content start to break down. Um, each one of these different articles that are really sales directed or high value yet data rich type of type of pieces of asset um, that are going to move the deal forward if they're done at the right time uh, in the right place, the right, you know, the right place of the, of the buyer's deciding journey. Um, but also specifically personalized for them, right, with their data. Uh, if you think about a quarterly business review, um, you know, there's a, how many companies don't do them every quarter, and it's because it's such an arduous task for the sales team to to go to 10-plus different systems to find the right data to stack it all into a, a, a poorly formatted, you know, PowerPoint slide deck and then go present it. Um, I think everyone on the call has probably received an ROI calculator that had nothing to do with our business or – or maybe, you know, capabilities decks that just weren't around our pains or our challenges. And so, like you said, I, I think, you know, this is really where, you know, the, the kind of the sales and marketing enablement solutions that are focused on really driving the right content at the right time for the sellers allow scalability in this type of approach to their, to their customer engagement. Yeah, and what you're really talking about, Jason, is the best of both worlds where marketing is creating the framework, marketing is, is creating the choreography, and sellers are populating that with the customer-specific information that they need to really personalize that asset and customize it for specific customer interaction. So everybody's following the same framework, but the sellers still have the flexibility. Our CEO, is, CEO always likes to say that at the end of the day, your sales reps still have to think, and they like to be able to control that interaction. So 
this gives them the ability to have that autonomy that they need to have those great conversations, but at the same time, it keeps them true to the message and keeps them true to the science. Um, so those are great points. So what does a great message look like? Um, I'm going to give you, give everybody on the call just a quick look at two specific message diagnostics, and then I'll show you how that those can play out in actual content assets. So the first one that you're seeing on the screen is a why change message. Remember with a why change message, what you're looking to do here is to disrupt the status quo. So you do this by helping your prospect see that their current state is unsafe and that they need to do something different. The science says that you do this by surfacing an unconsidered or unmet need. So in other words, you alert them to a problem that they either don't know they have or that they don't think is important enough to solve right now. So you're going to show them how costly not making a change can be and then contrast that risk with a better approach that's going to help them overcome the risk, resolve that risk, and then reach their desired goals. The big trick and the hardest part of creating a why change message is to never pitch a product. That's not what a why change message is all about. With a why change message, what you want is to get your prospect to buy into your approach before you start picking the product, pitching the product. Now, you definitely want to recommend an approach that leads directly to your differentiated capabilities, but you want the customer to come to the realization on their own, and you do that through your messaging. So what you're seeing now is just a quick example of how a why change message can appear in an asset. In this case, this is an infographic. Um, it's teeing up the case for an outsourcing relationship with a financial services organization. So the unmet need that you have here is all about financial services organizations that are focused so closely on the mechanics of banking that they don't have time to f concentrate on the business of banking, which is meeting customer needs and providing a higher level of service overall to their, to their customers and stakeholders. So if they don't ask, act, the risk here is that they will leave themselves vulnerable to threats from fickle customers, from more innovative competitors, and compliance agencies that put them at greater risk. That's the risk of staying with the status quo. So the better way to contrast is to offload the administrative and technical management and spend time and resources focused on what customers really need. And when they do this, they'll have more freedom to innovate and provide better service to customers without the disruption. So again, very simple, but you've got all the elements of this message diagnostic just on these, these couple, of, couple of shots, screenshots. So for a why stay message, you're gonna have a different diagnostic because your intent here is to get the customer to renew. So instead of getting them to change, you wanna make sure they keep doing what they're doing. And that means that you wanna reinforce and reaffirm the status quo. And you do this by first and foremost documenting the progress that they've made toward their goals by working with you and then reaffirming the wisdom of their decision to go with you in the first place. And then instead of showing them the risk of staying with the status quo, in this case, you're going to show them the risk of change. You want them to believe that change is difficult, it's scary, and it's expensive. So they should avoid it at all costs. And then finally, you want to make it so difficult for your customer to distinguish between you and the competition that they decide that it's just not worth it to go through all the pain and risk of change to end up with something that's just like what they're already buying from you. So again, the goal of a why stay message is to reinforce and reaffirm the status quo. And here's what that looks like. This is uh, just a couple of slides from a renewal presentation. So what you're seeing here is, you know, what are their original goals? What are they trying to do? standardize and enhance security, spend more time with customers, innovate quickly and nimbly. That's what their goals are. Then you've got some documented results to share, and this is where that personalization um, that Jason talked about really ties in here. You can actually focus on the actual results that they've achieved with you to reinforce what a great decision it, that they made to go with you in the first place. And then you hit them really hard on the risk of change. What are all the bad things that can happen if they move off their status quo? Now, all of these messages are pretty high level and generic. So again, as Jason said, what's gonna make them really effective is when you're able to personalize them for specific customers. And that's where technology can take some of the burden off your rep so they don't have to do all that work from, from scratch. Um, J Jason, how would a rep personalize this scenario? 
Well, I mean, there's a number of ways. I think you've got a great example here where you're restating the original reasons why the partnership ever took place, right? And likely there's some sort of milestones that have been set up that hopefully we've been achieving over the course of this partnership um, to, to reassure them that quantitatively we've hit some results that are that, that, that validate, you know, the reason why we ever first, um, uh, you know, partnered together. Um, and, and, and I think, I guess the challenging thing for the salesperson is, is that a lot of this data will live in a lot of different places, right? Depending on what the, you know, what the offer or what the product they're, they're, they're positioning. And so, um, and so to be able to enable this type of personalization and customization, extracting, you know, live data from a lot of different places and creating a very personal experience like this is, is quite a daunting task without automation. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, so thank you for that. So for your final level, I'm just going to touch briefly on this third level of content interrogation, which is the actual content diagnostic. At the end of the day, you want to create content for your sellers that's good. Like I said, I come from a content background. I'm a marketer. Um, creating really good assets is something that's really important to every marketer. And it's also important that I don't need to tell anyone on the phone that your buyers are bombarded with messages and content every day. And it's becoming harder and harder and harder to make your content rise above all that noise and really hit home. So what we've discovered through our work with clients is that there's really three key strategies to make your content stand out and to make it effective. We call them the three C's of great content, and they are context, contrast, and concrete visuals and language. So by context, we're talking about putting your message and information into the context of the buyer's experience. What are the trends? What are the issues? What are the challenges that are impacting their world? And then what kind of value, what kind of insights can you bring to them to help them draw the message from your messaging that's going to actually help them solve those issues? The second element that you want to build into all of your content is contrast. Our science, the behavioral science shows that people are more likely to take action to move away from a bad situation than they are to move toward a good situation. So that means that your assets have got to contain clear descriptions of risks and then comparisons to less favorable approaches to drive home that contrast with the value that you can bring. So you can do this a few ways. You can do it visually, by using color, by using imagery, and then you can also do it through the words you choose and the examples that you provide to really heighten and build up that sense of contrast. Value lies in the contrast between competing alternatives. So that's what your buyers are going to gravitate to. And then finally, concrete means simple, concrete visuals and language. That means original, memorable images that are understandable, that they're labeled, that they're easy to remember, so that a customer can look at an image a week later and remember the story that goes with it. And then from a language perspective, what you don't want to do is use a lot of fluffy value propositions and cliches. You want to use straightforward, meaningful words that show what you mean versus telling the buyer what you want them to take away from it. And it takes time. It takes time to create language like that. It's really easy to fall back into the trap of using cliches and using jargon. But I can tell you that when I look at a piece of content and I see the memorable words, the memorable images and the memorable words and the examples and the descriptions, it does make the hair on the back of my neck stand up a little bit because that's really good content and it's different. And just using the right visuals and language are going to make your assets stand out from, from the crowd. So here's a very quick example of a single page from an ebook that happens to contain all of the three C's, all of the elements that I was just talking about. The reality is that your asset is going to likely have multiple pages, so you don't necessarily have to have every element on every page, but you should have every element in every asset. So what you're seeing here, starting off with context, very clear, very vivid, vivid description of the customer's world, and it makes sure to contain some hooks and references to activities and departments that the customer is going to recognize, that they're going to be relevant, terminology that they're going to understand. And then next, it contrasts the status quo approach with the recommended better way. Here's your flawed approach. Here's what you need to be doing differently. Here's why you need to break out of the status quo. And then finally, over on the right, you see simple iconography and simple words to represent complex concepts 
that reinforce the buyer's ability to retain that message and to potentially maybe even retell it to someone else. So again, really quick example, but just focus on the three C's and focus on making that content vivid and memorable, and you'll end up being in good shape. So I know that most of the folks who are joining this webinar, you have likely thousands and thousands of assets that you're looking to organize, you're looking to automate, you're looking to get into the hands of your sellers. And I can already hear you asking yourselves how practical it's really going to be to put every single piece of content through its paces. So I've got two pieces of advice for you. Create your criteria first. So build a rubric, build a checklist, build some sort of analysis criteria that you can apply consistently across as many assets as possible so that you understand what's the decision that you're looking to support, how well does that asset support that decision, and how good is the actual content. And then secondly, this is where the advances of technology that I talked about at the beginning of the webinar can really come into play. Um, and Jason, what do you think about some of these concepts? How would, how would somebody go about approaching automating this assessment process? Yeah, well, like you said, there's some really exciting things going on, uh, particularly around machine learning and, and what that can help us do to, to properly identify, sort, and classify all the content we have. Uh, a lot of the companies here at present, I'm looking at the list, of, I've, I've got tens of thousands of pieces of content globally. Uh, operate in many different countries, different languages and lines of business and, and complexity and such. And so uh, this is where technology, I know, you know, obviously um, speaking for on, on our behalf, right, a lot of uh, <clears throat> we're deploying on quite a few algorithms to be able to help uh, our customers really accurately identify, sort and classify some of these content pieces uh, and then ultimately be able to provide the marketing teams the agility to to, to better approach these, these sales conversations as they're happening at any part you know, any part of the world. Um, and so that the, it's only reaching the very beginning stages of, you know, smart enablement um, and, and really excited to see how these things are going to further develop over the course of, you know, what could even be the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, I think those are great points. I mean, you know, keep going. Um, what are some of the takeaways that you recommend that customers, folks who are on this webinar walk away with? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, our goal is 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 really to make sure that our sellers have the right message at the right time, and and engaging with our customers at, at, across the entire engagement cycle, right? And in this case, um, right. the buyer's decision process. Um, as marketers, we want to have really clear insights as to what's positively influencing our revenue. Um, and so, you know, I I would I would really encourage this idea of, of of being able to to think predictively in the way you're prescribing the content. We don't want our sellers spending a lot of time on non-selling activity. We want them leveraging this whiteboard messaging and other types of messaging you're rolling out across the world um, and in front of their customers. That, that's, that's, why we, that's what we want our sales team to do. And so almost, you know, try to move away from the disorganization of hoarding content uh, of the tens of thousands and, and think more of along the lines of curating content and employing, you know, technology to be more predictive and very precise and, and the content that's recommended to the salesperson uh, in a given selling situation. Um, you know, look for look for ways to automate. Um, we talked about the high value that's associated with a lot of these pieces of content that will impact the buyer's decision and their whole process. Um, but, you know, to make it really hum, if you will, for lack of a better word, Leslie, it needs to be specific and it needs to be data rich and it needs to be, um, you know, quantifiable. And, and I think, you know, uh, expecting the sales team to do that and do it over and over again across a very consistent and accurate way is, is maybe expecting a bit too much. I bet I could run a poll in here and ask a lot of the marketers attending how many times they've spent 50% of their week, uh, you know, copy pasting data and building sales decks because there's a really important meeting and we've got our top executives going, right? And so, yeah. you know, look for ways to be able to automate that. Um, and then lastly, you know, uh, I think we would all, I think you would all be really, really shocked at some of the measurements and insights that we can now derive from what's happening after that lead conversion throughout the entirety of the sales process that used to historically somewhat be a black hole for marketing teams um, has been completely illuminated now. Uh, and there's there's really driving insight on not just what's happening with our content at high level adoption rates, but really how is our customer base and our prospect base engaging with the content that's being routed through our sales team. And so, you know, um, uh, I, I guess that's kind of, you know, the three things if I think about it, Leslie. 
Yeah, that's great. And, you know, the point that you that you made to me in one of our conversations was this idea that, you know, marketers are great at measuring right now, right? They're all about the measurement and they're really great at understanding a lot of those metrics that go into creating a conversion. But it does become more and more difficult once that conversion happens to really be able to track the effectiveness of that particular asset and what you know, automation and, and what, what technology and machine learning, what that's all bringing is just an extra level of insight and an extra level of information that is going to help you determine what is that great asset that must have asset and what assets can you retire and what don't you need. So um, automation brings measurement, which is a really great thing. Um, that's all I have. Um, Steve, I, I know that we wanted to open this up to questions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much, Leslie and Jason. That's 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 really good stuff. Uh, we do uh, definitely have some questions rolling in here. Um, and just as a reminder for everybody uh, on the call, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your uh, Q&A panel. Um, so first question I have here is for Jason. Jason, you talked about the importance of measuring content usage and, and consumption. Uh, what consumption metrics do you feel most help make the deal move forward? Yeah, hands down, uh, content engagement metrics, right? And I mean, I mean engagement by your customers and by your prospects throughout the sales cycles and and the expansion cycles that your your sellers are running. Um, you know, having insights as to what they're responding to, um, how much time are they spending on it, and, and what are they doing with the content, and how is that driving more energy into the sales opportunities? Um, benefits the salesperson to be able to better qualify and spend their time on opportunities that have legs, if you will. Uh, and it benefits at an aggregate level the marketing teams to to understand what what's driving that uh, that you know that uh, uh, that that drive um, that's ultimately influencing revenue right the the ultimate lagging deciding factor and so for me it's it's content engagement metrics um, and there's the, the amazing thing is the way that you know you can you can slice and dice and look at it how it happens across you know every every, every different uh, sales cycle so that that's it for me Steve. All right, Jason. Thanks so much. Uh, next question here is for Leslie. Leslie, you talked about interrogating content assets based on their intent. What if you have an asset that seems to support more than one decision? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I, I, my advice to you is figure out what is what is the purpose that you really want that asset to serve. Um, do you, where where do you feel like it's going to add the most value? One of the things that we see. We see a lot, for example, is um, customers a lot of times will combine the why change and why you messages into a single asset, right? And that I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. Um, I would say that an asset like that would probably live more on the why you side because essentially you're reiterating your why change message, but you're definitely adding in that why you content as well. So take a look at the intent, take a look at what decision is that asset? Does it best support? And then align them accordingly. Okay, cool. Uh, next question, Leslie, is for you as well. Uh, can you explain the difference between a why stay and a why evolve message? When would you use one over the other? Yeah, that's a great question too. So the simple answer is you're going to use a why stay message in a renewal situation. So where you want to make sure that the customer continues to do exactly what they've been doing with you all along. Um, you want them to renew a contract. You want them to buy the same thing. You want them to re-up something. So you want them to stay in the status quo. With a why evolve message, this is an interesting one. And, and this is some, some research that we just actually finished this year. Um, a why, you me a why Evolve message is kind of a hybrid between a why stay and a why change message because you want them to stay with you, but at the same time, you want them to change what they're doing with you. So it's a little bit of a tricky conversation, but essentially with a why Evolve message, you're trying to get them to buy something different with you. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to reinforce the value of the relationship that you have with that customer. You want them to still feel safe, still feel secure, still feel comfortable that they chose to work with you in the first place. But like anything else, their world is constantly changing. Their market is changing. And to navigate these changes in the world, they need to do something different with you. And since they made such a great choice to go with you to begin with, 
they should also make that same choice to work with you to overcome these new challenges because there are great opportunities ahead if you work together. So a Why Evolve message is about really building on that relationship of trust, reinforcing that relationship, and then introducing change into their world, but it's a controlled kind of change where you're able to take them through and guide them through that process of change by keeping them with you. All right, thanks Leslie, really appreciate that. Uh, next question here is for Jason. Jason, how, how, do you, how do you balance saving your seller's time through content automation but still ensure that your buyers receive you know, a, a personalized experience like what we've been talking about? Yeah. Well, you know, um, I think, Leslie, I think you mentioned earlier, on, even maybe on one of your first slides, that 48% of the content's either coming from sales team or, or other people that aren't marketing, right? Um, and it is, it is a bit of a frightening percentage because it, it takes time. Uh, to create good content, and we we know that probably the quality of content coming out of the the team is, is from the seller's perspective maybe not be uh, the the best in the world, right? At least consistent. Yeah, the research more. actually shows that sellers spend forty hours a month of their own time creating their own content. So that's a think scary stat that. for marketers. <laughs> think about that. Yeah, forty forty hours a month, right? It's a scary yeah. stat for for sales sales leaders as well. As I mentioned earlier, I, I want them in front of in front of our customers and having conversations that are that are, uh, you know, engaging and, and not working on content. So I guess, you know, so I guess, I guess first to answer the question, Steve, I mean, first of all, we got to recognize that they're doing this, right? And, and really appreciate what that cost, what that cost is. Um, uh, what, what, what does 40 hours cost our, our sales team? What does it cost our brand integrity and other things that go along with them creating their own content and then enable them with some sort of, some sort of tool that allows to, you know, put rels on, on the content, keep, keep our branding, our message consistent with what, uh, what it is we want to do and how we want to grow our company, um, and then and then enable certain areas of the material that they're going to market with, uh, with customer data. Uh, we've got data about our customers all over the place right now, whether it's in our CRMs or within our marketing automation tools or or other other facets of our organization. And so, you know, really employing that data as as um, as embedded artifacts of, of just value throughout the different art, you know, the documents that we can automate for them. Um, is, is, is kind of how I, I see it, I guess. All right, question. fantastic, Jason. Fantastic, Jason. Uh, uh, next question here. Uh, any recommendations on change management internally, uh, specifically bringing folks along when sales has been creating assets in their basement and want their unique <laughs> voice reflected in custom assets? So yeah. I can speak to part of this, Jason, and you can speak to part of this too. Um, one of the things that you'll hear from us is one of the best ways to, to kind of instigate that change management is to make sure that you're, you're training your sellers in the same way that your marketers are creating the messages. So in other words, it doesn't do any good to simply implement a new way of marketing and content creations if your sellers don't know why content is suddenly being created this way. And similarly, you can't just train your sellers on a new way of speaking to customers unless marketing is brought in and they come along. So what you're going to hear from us is that you really need a parallel path where you're educating your marketers and you're educating your sellers at the same time. Leslie, uh, you know, inspired by you, uh, I, I'm going to have a whole campaign about getting the seller out of the basement, right? The, the idea that out my sales team is in a basement <laughs> <laughs> just frightens me to to to, to no end. Um, get the seller out of the basement, you know, um, enabled him with 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 content that's that's pushed to them and it's prescribed and and maximize their customer facing time. Uh, I'm still thinking about 40 hours a month in the basement um, it isn't healthy for anybody, particularly particularly for your top line revenue, right? <laughs> oh, very good, guys. Very good. Um, so with that, you know, I really do want to thank you, Jason and Leslie, and, and thank everyone uh, for attending today's webinar. And, and again, as a reminder, following the event uh, or, or after today, we'll be sending all attendees a recording of the webcast along with the slides and usually give us about 24 hours or so to, to get those over to you. So on behalf of myself, of Leslie, of Jace for Jason. Thank you very much for everybody for joining us today and please have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye.